Welcome back, future social workers. Welcome to Case Management 535. I hope you all are excited for today's lecture. Some of you, I think, may be feeling a little nervous about today's lecture. Um, if you looked on the syllabus, one of the things that we'll be discussing today, or our main focus for today, will be biopsychosocial and spiritual assessments. So I know in a case management class, a class that's already designed to be a little heavy in response to writing and reading and performing case notes and documentation, but you all are just super excited and there's nothing more that you wanted to do when becoming a social worker than to do paperwork. I know you entered the field because you said, if anyone does any paperwork, it's a social worker and I'm gonna change the world through my paperwork. I know you're probably not thinking that. And I know sometimes this class can be have a focus on a lot of what we've been talking about related to documentation. If you notice, I've been very deliberate in trying to incorporate not only the skill set that you need, in order to complete your documentation accurately and timely. But what I've also been trying to do is connect the dots between the heart and the head and how you go about doing your case management. So with that in mind, we're gonna move into today's lesson on biopsychosocial and spiritual assessments. Some of you may be nervous because you're saying, well, that sounds kind of intimidating. This terminology that we're gonna use, completing an assessment, maybe preparing a client for treatment and diagnosing sounds a little scary to you. But please, if that's you, don't be worried, don't be anxious. Remember, this is the first class that you're taking in case management. You are later going to have other classes that place what you're learning um, in this course into practice. You're also gonna have other opportunities to discuss diagnosing and completing your biopsychosocial spiritual assessments. So you don't need to be nervous. All you wanna do is just focus on the message today. Um, I, hope, I purposely designed this lesson to have less slides to cover so that what we can do is really dive into the intent and the purpose of completing a biopsychosocial assessment. So this is a nice, easy um, first step to take right into the field of completing assessments as a social worker. So without further ado, don't be nervous. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and we will jump into our lesson. Okay, so as promised, in Case Management 535, one of the things that we are implementing and discussing is the Case Management Generalist Intervention Model, or GIM as we refer to. At this point in the course, we are actually in the planning phase now of the GIM model. Um, if we were to also update ourselves and discuss wraparound, Wraparound actually is also referred to as just the planning model. So whether you're general, in, uh, sorry, planning phase. So whether you are in the general interventionist model or you are in wraparound implementation, remember I said the two are closely aligned in their stages, then you need to know that in both of these stages, they're just referred to as the planning stage. And that follows, okay, the engagement phase um, of getting to know the client, okay? In the planning phase, what you're going to be doing now is you're gonna be working on two things, continuing to establish rapport with the client and building on the strengths, but also what you'll be doing now is developing a plan, okay? Now in social work, we refer to that plan as the biopsychosocial spiritual assessment, and this is what it is here, okay? Now, like I said, this is gonna be very practical. We're not gonna get into all of the weeds, and in this course, what we're gonna do is give you an introduction to what a biopsychosocial assessment is, as well as some overview of how you go about completing it. You'll have an opportunity in this course to also relay or practice um, some of these skill sets related to a biopsychosocial assessment um, um, in your assignments, okay? So let's just talk about first what it is, okay? So a biopsychosocial and spiritual assessment is conducted by therapists, counselors, social workers, all right, at the beginning of therapy, um, and it assesses for bio, biological, psychological, and social factors that may be contributing to a problem and or problems with a client. It's considered to be a holistic assessment, looking at a client on all different levels. So here's what's important to understand. There is language, as you can see, that's missing from the title here, spiritual, right? That's not in here. The reason I did that with intention is because previously, and in some sectors of, let's say, um, secular social work, you will still encounter pockets of, of assessments. And so for the sake of this lesson too, let me just go ahead and say this. I'm gonna to refer to our biopsychosocial and spiritual assessments as purely just assessments, okay? One, for the sake of you don't have to hear me stumbling over the term 
over and over throughout the entire lecture. And the second reason is sometimes when you enter the field of social work, you're gonna hear social workers just referring to them as the assessment, okay? So chances are you wanna ask for clarification in your field, but chances are when a social worker is saying, yeah, we have an assessment to complete, we just received a new referral for a client, they are referring to the biopsychosocial spiritual assessment. So for the sake of this course though, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is in the past, in the secular world, you may see where individuals um, may not include the spiritual aspect in their assessment. Now, the reason why we're referring to the spiritual um, aspect in this course, one is because we're CBU, right? We also understand that the aspect of our spirituality and our religious practices deeply impact the decisions that we make, our worldview, and our way of coping sometimes with stressors that are out in the real world. It is a part of our identity and therefore, it's important to acknowledge. However, it's also important to acknowledge as research has shown, and many organizations that are utilizing social workers to complete assessments are including the spiritual now. So some of you may enter into the field and you may start conducting your assessment and you'll notice on your form that there's no spot for spirituality. If that's the case, it's still important to understand your case planning process where there won't be a place on your assessment for it. However, what I wanna prepare you all for is that there's an increasingly larger number of individuals incorporating, of organizations incorporating the spiritual component into their assessment because they do understand the impact of spirituality on an individual's identity. And if we are to consider that we're conducting our assessments in a holistic manner, right, considering multiple levels of a person's identity, then this is important to consider, okay? So this biopsychosocial assessment that you are gonna be completing is important because it's going to drive your planning process. So let me say this again. I've used this analogy in wraparound as well, okay? When you're gonna take a vacation and you wanna go on vacation somewhere, you need to plan out the steps of how you're gonna accomplish that goal, right? So some of you may have timeshares and maybe you pay into vacation, so it's a mere matter of reserving a, uh, a location, right? For some folks, you may not have a timeshare, so what you're gonna do is actually save up money in order to go on this vacation. But in order to do that, you need to have a plan in place. The vacation is your final destination. That's where you wanna end up. That's your vacation fund spot, right? But the plans that you take to budget, to set aside funds, to organize your travel, to choose your excursions, and all of those other things, those are the steps along the way. If at any point your plan is inaccurate, you're not gonna make it to your vacation spot, right? If you missed budget your money, if you plan for the worst excursions of all time, right? If you, um, if you forget to book a flight, okay, you won't make it to your final destination. So what's important to understand here is that an assessment is like that. Think of it as planning for your vacation, right? You wanna make sure that every detail has been planned for and considered in order to have that good time later on. So that in a simplest sense is what a biopsychosocial and spiritual assessment is, okay? So let's move on. I wanna give you some tips about this biopsychosocial assessment so you understand a little bit better what this means for you as a social worker. What are you gonna be doing when you conduct these assessments, okay? So here's a little thing about assessments, all right? And then I'm gonna give you some personal history related to me and assessments, okay? You are going to do a lot of them throughout your career, all right? Part of what we do as social workers, just to prepare you on this, is that when you receive a new client that you referred, whether that's a foster youth, or it's child in um, juvenile placement, uh, juvenile hall, or it's an individual without housing, it's an individual without citizenship, it's an aging youth, it's someone in a hospital, you are gonna be responsible as a social worker for conducting assessments with your clients. These assessments are to determine what's going on with the client, right? Where is there, in the clinical language, a degree of impairment okay, or where is there a dysfunction in this client's life, all right, that is impacting their ability to lead a successful, whole, rewarding life. And so assessments are the process, all right, of exploring and planning for the services with your client. Once you complete your assessment, you are now going to, going to be able to say, here are the strategies that are in place. Here are all the things, specific things we're gonna do. Maybe it's therapy, maybe it's diet, maybe it's housing resources, right? Maybe it's a connection with the church or a community. Maybe it's food banks, whatever the case is, but you're going to say through your assessment, here's the identifying problem, all right? Here's the history or some of the factors that have contributed to that problem in the past. And 
um, here's our plan on how we're gonna assist our client, okay? So please plan on doing many of these throughout your career. I, I lost count, honestly, on how many assessments I've done um, over 15 years of doing social work, okay? So you may be working on several uh, assessments simultaneously. That's important to understand. Um, I think early on, when I first moved into my casework, I maybe had two assessments going on at any given time. When you are cranking, especially if you're gonna be doing clinical work as a therapist, all right, and you're in a clinic or you're going out into people's homes and providing therapeutic services, you are gonna be doing multiple assessments at the same time. I kid you not, let's say you are a therapist and you have, let's just say a nice smooth number of 10 clients on your caseload at any given time. It is not unrealistic that in heavy seasons of new referrals, when, you're, when your um, caseload is turning over and you've, you've graduated a large number of, of uh, clients and now you're receiving more in, you may be working on five, six, even seven assessments at any given time. So it's just to prepare you, all right, for what this will look like. There is always going to be a deadline in place for your assessments. There has never been a time in my entire career when my social worker or supervisor, right, my supervisor hands me a new referral and says, hey, Antonio, feel free to go ahead and get this assessment done when you feel like it. It never works that way. In fact, most of the time, what's gonna happen is, they're gonna to say to you, I'm sorry, this referral came to us late. You've actually got less time to complete your assignment, your assessment. The reason why I want you to, to pay attention to that is not to scare you, but I want you to have a realistic vision that when you're completing these assessments, it's not like maybe what's gonna be in the movies when you see social workers for traders are taking all this time to get to know the client and they've got you know three months of work in there and, and now they're sitting down and completing their assessment. I wish sometimes we had that, right? But the reality is, is that especially when you're providing clinical services that are funded by Medi-Cal or Medicaid as we refer to it, right? You're gonna have state deadlines, county deadlines, and agency deadlines that you need to meet to complete this comprehensive assessment, okay? Now, whether you are clinical or community focused, you are going to complete assessments, okay? So, I was actually more community, more macro focused in my work, okay? But that still meant I had to conduct an assessment I was still providing groups, uh, by, um, psychoeducational groups to children. I was still working with children and families. And so my assessment skills were utilized not only as a RAP facilitator, but also within the agency I was working with. So some of you may be thinking that you are going community and you're saying, well, I don't plan on doing therapy. Um, so therefore I don't need to really worry about doing the biopsychosocial assessment. Uh, that's not going to be the case. Whether you're doing therapy and working as a clinician or whether you're not, but you're still serving clients in the capacity of resources and general case management, you will be completing biopsychosocial assessments, okay? So please hold on to the lessons today. Don't tune this out because what I'm going to give you today is essential, is going to be essential for the rest of your career, okay? Finally, I want to give you two words of encouragement. Don't be afraid of completing a biopsychosocial assessment. It sounds intense. When you first look at a form, um, for an assessment, you may feel overwhelmed. It's going to have tons of boxes to check and to write. And you're going to say, I have to research all of this. And where am I going to get this information? How am I going to do this? I don't want you to worry, okay? In fact, the more you do, the better you will become, okay? When I look back on some of my earlier days of completing assessments right out of um, school and learning, okay, the process of this in real time, I thought to myself that I had it all down. The more that I did assessments, the more I realized there could be more deliberate ways of asking questions and, like I say, more deliberate ways of building rapport with my clients to extract more from the assessment process, all right? And so you will just become better at assessments the more you do them. So please don't feel intimidated by this process. Social workers do assessments, okay? Some are sharp and exceptionally great at them. Some have a place to grow. We all have room for improvement, okay? So what I'm gonna do is when I talk about assessments today and give you this overview, I'm giving you the overview in the most um, um, boiled down and practical way, all right, with the years of experience behind me to hopefully help you understand on a more practical level what assessments are used for and how they benefit clients so you don't have to struggle like some other social workers that may be entering the field uh, right away, okay? So let's talk about a biopsychosocial spiritual assessment. It's a long name, right? But the idea behind it is it's broken up into these categories. So if you notice, 
biological, psycho, social, spiritual assessment. There you go, right? And so the idea behind this is when we receive a new client and we have not worked with this client before, whatever their background, whatever the group is, we have to, as a social worker, not just pick up with the plan that's been put in uh, before us. Maybe they're being transferred from one clinic to another. And as a result, they're coming into your hands. And so an assessment's already been done. You are more than welcome to review that previous assessment. But I highly encourage that you never cut corners and simply copy that assessment over into yours. You will miss something, I guarantee it. On top of that, as social workers, sometimes we have different perspectives from other clinicians or counselors that have done their work. We've been trained a little differently. And as a result of that, we may pick up on some things that maybe weren't as important or weren't as high of a priority as other counselors. That's not to knock other professions, but the idea is that you're bringing a different lens and perspective to the table to your client. So never cut corners, okay? The idea behind this is in your assessment phase, you are going to be sitting down and what we refer to as interviewing a client or speaking, connecting with your new client, right? Remember what I talked about, it's important to build relationships because in the process of conducting your assessment, you are going to ask a ton of questions. You're also going to read a lot of paperwork. You're going to read up on the client's history. Many times the files that come with our clients are going to have um, previous uh, reports conducted by a physician. They're going to have IEPs in there. They are going to have um, other team meetings and staffings from other social workers and professionals in the past. You're going to need to review that information so that you can build on your assessment and complete your assessment on its template, okay? And so I'm going to do this. Let's go through each of these very briefly. And what I want to do is draw down on some of the information that you're going to be looking for when completing your assessment. What's important to understand is once you have your biopsychosocial assessment completed, this will then eventually lead to, if you're doing clinical work, you're diagnosing. So the more you understand the background of the clients and what they're coming with and what they're presenting with to you in terms of their symptomology, their degrees of impairment, whatever the case is, that will help you better focus down to an area to diagnose, okay? Your axis one, your axis two. So what's really important to understand is this needs to be holistic. So let's take the first one. One of the first things you're going to do when completing your assessment is first assess for the biological, the physiological factors, okay, with your body that is impacting the client. So things like the client's medical history, taking into account any conditions, terminal conditions, lifelong conditions that they're coming with is really important. You are going to want to ask questions of the client, asking about their general health, asking um, about things like how old they are, how old their parents were, maybe do they know when they passed away. Gender expression, so this is important to understand because if an individual that you're serving maybe is in the process of transitioning, let's say from male to female, and they want to express their gender, they desire to express their, their gender as female, but they are male, there may also be some biological um, um, factors to consider such as medication, hormone therapy, and other things. So what's really important to understand is what may be presenting as a behavioral issue, a concern, maybe something like, which we've seen in traditional hormone therapy um, with transgender individuals who are undergoing hormone therapy, is sometimes experiencing physical symptoms. Sometimes it's a matter of temperature, feeling fever. Sometimes there's issues of anxiety or aggression or even irritability, all right? Changes in voice and things like this. This is important to understand because an individual may present with certain symptoms that others may interpret as behavioral, but they're associated with a biological um, a source, the medication, okay? But that also is important to understand it can have psych psychological impacts on that individual, right? If people are bullying them, making fun of them, discriminating against them because of the process, that will have a psychological impairment. But for the sake of this, let's stay on biological. So development, developmental milestones, if a child was exposed in utero to uh, substances such as cocaine, uh, methamphetamines, alcohol, um, nicotine, these are all going to have an impact on the individual's physical development. It may slow milestones. These are things that we need to be aware of when we're planning treatment for an individual. Um, things to consider like genetics, medication, substance dependency. This would fall into biological because one of the things that we are starting to learn through our research, right, is that substance dependency 
um, can come as a result of emotional trauma that has been experienced in the past, absolutely. But there may also be a genetic predisposition to individuals and inheriting traits um, that can lead to addictive behaviors later on in life. And so to understand is that if an individual is saying, well, you know, I don't, I'm not a dysfunctional alcoholic, but I do drink every night, but it's not a problem because I'm able to get up and go to work and I, I don't have a problem in my relationships or whatever the case is, it's important to understand and ask the question, okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your parents? Would you describe them maybe as having similar behaviors um, related to drinking as you exhibit now in your adulthood? Would you say they were functioning alcoholics as well? They may say, well, actually, yeah, my dad tended to drink every day. He had a couple beers when he came home from work. He was a construction worker or whatever the case is. Well, now what we're doing is developing a pattern of history of substance dependency, particularly the use of alcohol with this particular client. So now that's gonna change our treatment process and how we're gonna proceed. It may also uh, include if there was a mental health diagnosis present that maybe we're talking about a co-occurring disorder, okay, or what we refer to as a dual diagnosis when we have a mental health disorder combined with a substance dependency, okay? In the psychological, we're gonna to wanna to explore, ask questions, research during the assessment phase, psychiatric symptoms, both past and present. Does an individual have a history of audio or visual hallucinations? Does the individual have a history of psychiatric medications, maybe for bipolar disorder, anxiety, depression, right? Does the individual have a history or actively present mental illness? Is there coming with, are they coming with a current diagnosis, which is really important? Many times you're gonna receive a client that you are, is new to you, but is, was being treated by another clinician in the past. You may at times not see eye to eye with the previous diagnosis of that clinician. It's important to understand though, that we don't wanna just change the diagnosis willy nilly. At that point, if a client is coming to us with a diagnosis, and we are considering changing that, all right, then we need to sit down with the client and also explain to them, one, whether they understand the diagnosis that they had before, two, you wanna inform them that you're seeing things differently and based on the symptomology they're presenting with, you wanna change the diagnosis, but also consider that they need to understand why and they need to understand how this is gonna impact the course of their treatment. So it's really important to understand what they're coming with. A history of mental illness is really particularly important. So if there's a history of psychiatric symptoms, um, uh, behaviors, diagnoses, treatment in the family, that may have a bearing on treatment. So at times what we've seen in some of the research is there are certain mental health disorders, all right, that are passed down either through the male side or even hereditary through the female side. And so it's not saying that males or only females will, will have a particular diagnosis, but sometimes what we're seeing through the research is that there's a higher rate of mental health diagnosis being passed down hereditary, okay, through particular genders. And so that's important to understand. Um, you also want to understand the psychological current or past stressors or, or trauma that is impacting a client. So for example, when exploring in a biopsychosocial assessment, there may be patterns of which clients may suddenly experience increases in mental health crises during specific times of the year. They've established a pattern even of it being cyclical. Let me give you an example. I worked with a young lady one time who was uh, an educator. She was a teacher. And so she had received treatment for anxiety, depression, um, many times throughout the past. By the time she was coming to me to discuss some of the symptomology and her impairments in her life, specifically, her life would blow up towards the end of summer. She would have difficulty in her relationship. Her family and home life was unstable. She started to dabble in substance dependency. She started to use alcohol all right, to cope with some of the stressors. When we started to talk about this more, we discovered that she was receiving treatment for similar symptoms almost at the end of every single summer. It was becoming a pattern. The more we got to talk about this, the more we started to understand that for this particular young lady, she was a teacher, an educator, and she was stressed out. She had anxiety about meeting her, her students for the first time. And what she was really worried about was, is how she would be received to her students. She had anxiety, and that anxiety got so um, intense for her 
all right, that she started to sort of break down in every aspect of her social life right around the same time every year before she went back to school. Once she went back to school, she established a relationship with her clients, things would get better, and life would move on and she would pick up. But there was this almost complete breakdown at the end of, uh, of the summer going back into the school year. And so this is how a history of traumas or stressors comes into play when planning. So when we were talking about a case plan, we were talking about treatment, what I needed to do was make sure that she was linked with a therapist who was going to be able to talk her through the sense of awareness and positive coping mechanisms so that she understood, one, that she was feeling anxious, two, it was associated with returning to school, and three, here are some coping mechanisms you can use, right, to, to sort of um, cope, for lack of a better word, right, with these stressors, the worry, the anxiety that you're feeling about returning to work, okay? So this is why it's important to discuss not only what are the current symptoms, but have these symptoms happened before, okay? Now, when we're exploring social aspects of a client's identity, of their life, of their history, you wanna consider things like family relationships and history, right? What has that been like? Some clients are gonna to come to you and they have literally burned every single bridge, every single relationship they've had with a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, mom, dad, brother, sister has been burned. And as a result of that, they are feeling isolated. Well, anyone would feel isolated, right? If you didn't have someone positive and connected um, with you that loves you and cares for you in your life, right? Living situations, environments, is this person living in a home? Are they living in a, in a house, in an apartment, right? Are they living in their car? Are they couch hopping from one place to the other? That's going to drastically in, in, um, impact that individual's mental health and well-being. And so what's really important to understand is the living situation. Sexuality, different, okay, from gender expression, right? So one thing that's important to understand is an individual may identify as male, female, or none of the above, okay? But also who they choose to love, who they choose to engage in a relationship with is really important to understand. Let me give you an example of this because some of you may be thinking, well, how are the two necessarily different or why would they misalign? Let me give you an example just very quickly. So a young male, okay, a teenager can come and present to you and say, um, I present as what I believe to be a heterosexual, all right, um, cisgender male, all right? So I identify as male with the anatomy that I was born with. I believe that I am attracted to females. However, okay, they may say to you, I've never been intimate with a female, okay? The problem is at a young age, the teenager may have been molested or sexually assaulted by a male caregiver. As a result of that, the only intimacy, and I shouldn't say intimacy in this case, but the only physical um, um, sexual encounter that this young male has had has been with another male and in a warped, disfigured sense of what a relationship would look like. And as a result of that, the male may have, um, the young man may express themselves as saying, I believe that I'm attracted to females, but I'm also very conflicted psychologically. I'm conflicted because during my abuse cycle, my abuser stated that I was gay and this is why he was acting out on me. And so sometimes you'll have a young man coming to you and saying, I believe that I'm sexually attracted to a female, but how can I know that when I've not had an intimate relationship with a female and I have been told by my abuser in the past that I was gay. So you see how the two may not line up. Okay, so that's very important to understand how one category such as social can impact the other, such as psychological, okay? Um, history of abuse, for obvious reasons, we wanna know. Some of you are already familiar with the ACEs study or the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. If you're not, don't worry, you will cover that extensively in other classes. But the whole idea from the ACEs study was what we learned was, is that there is a scientific connection between the abuse that we experience in our childhood that can lead to increased rates of morbidity, which means early death, Okay, um, chronic diseases such as lung conditions, cardiovascular conditions, diabetes, and substance dependency later on in life. And so, if a client is coming to me and saying, I was abused as a child for a period of three years, right, from eight to 11, and I still have nightmares to that day, well, one of the things you want to go back and consider in your biological aspect is, does this individual present with diabetes? Do they smoke? 
Do they drink as a, as, a, um, as a coping mechanism to this? Are they not getting enough sleep? Do they have a sleep disorder? Whatever the case is, are they overweight? Okay, as a result of these issues. So what's really important to understand is this is again where the two can be linked. And finally, what you also wanna talk about are current and potential risks. So individuals, when I worked with um, youth who were involved in gangs, okay, the social risks were quite high, right? So a child may not feel like they are in danger. Sometimes the kiddos that I was working with had become desensitized to the level of violence that was around them, both in their neighborhoods and in their households, um, due to um, gang relationships. But what's important to understand is, is that the risk is still there. And so the risk of one of my clients who lives in a multi-generational gang household, right, who is making every step to become involved in their family's gang, when they step out of the home, because of the environment in which they live, right, they may be at risk of higher incidence of shootings, stabbings, drug overdoses, right, and inter, uh, interpartner violence, okay, than in other settings. And so that's really important to understand. Um, support system and resources, families who are isolated, individuals who are isolated have less opportunities to receive help when life gets heavy, right? Some of you have seen me use this analogy we all have cell phones and chances are we all have someone in our cell phone that we could call, right, at um, two o'clock in the morning if we were in severe help, in severe need of help, and someone would pick up our phone, right? We would know that someone loved and cared for us and would be there for us no matter what. Some of our clients literally have no one to call. They don't even have a phone to call, right? And so support systems, resources is really important to factor. Now, finally, in conducting your assessment, there's the spiritual aspect. And like I said, some agencies may choose still to not utilize the spiritual um, section of completing an assessment. But honestly, by the time you step into the field, a large majority of you are going to encounter this, right? So I wanna make a quick disclaimer on this. Sometimes students in the past have asked the question, they said, well, if I'm not a believer, right? If I don't identify as um, particularly believing in any, any particular God and I don't practice a religion, should I be doing a spiritual assessment? To the response that I say, yes, okay? You don't need to be a believer in order to do an assessment. What's also important to understand is if you do identify as a believer, if you believe in God, okay, or you even practice another religion other than Christianity, what's important to understand is the notion is that your worldview, okay, it's not our responsibility as a social worker to impress our worldview onto the spiritual um, component of the assessment. What we're not, we're not doing is passing our spirituality, faith, or religion onto the client. What we're doing is trying to understand and assess where their spirituality and faith, and even if they practice a religion, is impacting their life, okay? So we are learning from them. We are not imparting anything upon them in this process, okay? So in regards to spiritual beliefs, this is one thing you're going to want to look at. Would your client say that they're spiritual and religious? Would they say they're only spiritual, maybe not religious, whatever the case is? That's important to understand, okay? Um, Faith-based activities. So an individual may say, yes, I, I believe in God. Yes, I am religious. I go to church every single Sunday. Um, but they may say, you know, I just go to church. That's the extent of it. Then I go home or I go to breakfast with my family and I'm done, right? Others will say, no, I'm, I participate in um, leading our youth group or... You know, I go out and I feed the hungry, or I'm involved in detention ministry, right? Or we set up pop-up um, pop homeless shelters or whatever the case is. And so the degree to which an individual is involved with their faith-based community is important to factor in, okay? Um, if they're involved in an organized religion, this is really important to understand um, because you want to factor in then some other um, categories that may be associated with that. So let me give you a quick example. Um, if a person is diabetic, okay, so in their assessment, you've covered under biological that they have diabetes type 2, right? And so I'm using myself as an example um, so, so that you can kind of see where this comes into play, okay? Diabetes type 2, right? And let's say they're controlling their diabetic symptoms, not through medication, but through just diet and exercise right now. So you've got it in check. You're doing well, right? But let's say that they are um, identifying as Catholic, okay? And as a result of that, they are spiritual, they are religious, and they, they practice their Catholic faith um, um, dedicatedly, okay, devoutly. 
So here's something important to understand that if you are working with an individual who says that to you in their assessment, they may also say, I want to ask the question, are you in the habit of then fasting during Lent on Fridays? Some individuals who are Catholic may say, well, no, I don't fast on Lent on Fridays, but I avoid, I abstain from eating meat on Fridays. Other people during Lent will say, well, no, um, more traditional Catholics, pre-Vatican II, okay, are going to say, well, actually, I'm not going to eat at all on Fridays, okay? And on Sundays, some may say, I don't eat, not only don't I not eat meat, I don't eat anything. I fast all day on Sunday. I only drink water or tea or coffee, all right, during those days. Well, now here's what's really important to understand. If you're a type 2 diabetic and you haven't taken proper steps towards your diet and exercise, your blood sugar is going to be out of whack. What's important to understand when your blood sugar is out of whack is your behavior can be out of whack too. Irritability, confusion, okay, can pass in. And so if an individual now has strained relationships as a result of simply not eating, all right, because of a religious practice, it's important to understand that. What's also important to understand is that that's a delicate conversation to have with a client who's a devout practitioner of their religion who has made a life choice maybe related to their diet that's impacting their health, okay? And so what may be important to understand is as a resource, if you attempt to talk to the client and they're, they're saying, well, you know what? I'm not appreciate you telling me how I should practice my faith and my faith is more important to me, all right, than necessarily um, my diet at this point, um, they may be turned off to the conversation of how to take care of their health and how it's impacting their relationships. But if you were to bring a resource, such as a priest in this case, who may say, well, look, there have been some changes to the requirements uh, within the Catholic Church that, that if you are diabetic or have a health condition, you are okay to not fast, right, during these times because you need to take care of your health. If a priest tells them that, they may be more inclined to listen. So that's important to understand how you, you make these considerations, okay? Um, and finally, resources. Faith-based communities, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Protestant, whether um, it's Muslim, all right, or whether it's Jewish or whatever the case is, in a faith-based community, there is a wealth of resources available to our clients, right? So sometimes that's through clothing, food, rental assistance, right, financial, but also the spiritual comfort, the spiritual support that comes with being part of a faith-based community. So I hope you understand that as we move to through these, and I'm sorry I took time on this, but like I said, there's less slides to go through today. I hope this really helps you understand that when you're in the process of asking questions in a biopsychosocial and spiritual assessment, these are the issues that you're trying to understand with your clients. I hope you also understand then that there can be a challenge, right? When you're meeting with up to six clients in a week and you're in the process of gathering this information, how it can be a challenge to, um, to, to remember, right, and to keep track of all this information. So just something I hope that you'll find helpful as you move through your careers. Okay. So I want to provide you with, now that we've gone through the basics of the assessment, um, what you're looking for, the type of information you're trying to provide, what I want to do is just give you some quick tips on completing a comprehensive assessment. These tips here have come from me personally in completing biopsychosocial and spiritual assessments in the past. Um, I have learned that if you can adhere to these tips, not only can you complete more comprehensive, better quality assessments, but you'll be able to do them in a more efficient way. You'll be able to do them in less time, which means that you as a social worker will be freed up to do other things all right, with your clients. So that's important to understand. So here are some quick tips. One, you always want to start with relationships. Remember what I've said in this class is that this course is about balancing the head and the heart, right? So you're going to feel overwhelmed sometimes when you got to go through all this. You're going to want to ask the clients and start rattling off questions. Can you tell me about your medical history? Um, what, what, at what age did your parents pass away? Okay, do you, um, do you identify yourself as male or female or are you cisgender? What is the case? Uh, you want any medication? If you start flying through the questions, if you start doing it in a way that is absent of empathy, absence of relationship and trust, your clients won't open up to you at all. The process of conducting your assessment is almost futile because you're going to receive minimal information from your client. So when I say that social work, case management is a combination of the head and the heart, always start with your heart, all right? Go in, introduce yourself, take your time, let them see you as a person, right? Walk them through the process of saying, has anyone maybe completed an assessment with you before? Take the time to ask that question. 
some of our clients that have been around for a long period of time are going to say, I've sat through 20, 30 assessments, right? And then you're going to say, you know, you want to follow up with the question, how were those for you? What has been your experience? And they'll say, you know what? Every single social worker just breezed through this thing. They didn't ask me how I was doing. They just wanted to know the basic material and I'm tired of assessments. And so sometimes I've had to stop and say, first, apologize, right? I'm sorry for the experiences that you've had. And I'm sorry that I'm number 31, right? In the line of social workers or counselors that have completed an assessment for you. Can we maybe take the time where we let's have, just have a conversation? Let's, let's you tell me your story. And as you're telling me your story, I'm gonna look for the items in this assessment, right? And then would it be okay if anywhere where I'm seeking clarity or I wanna understand, could I, could I ask you for some information to fill in that story? Would that be okay? And many times clients will say, yeah, thank you, right? And so that's important to understand. Um, during assessment phase, when you're completing the assessments, it's important to listen more than you speak, right? And I use this example, God gave us two ears in one mouth, which I believe he's saying that when you're in assessment, you need to listen twice as much as you speak. The more we speak, that means the less the client speaks. And the less the client speaks means the less information we are receiving in these categories. So it's really important to understand that when you're in the assessment, even though you're going to want so much for something to come out of your mouth, right? Make sure you stop for a second and say, let them go. Let me look because what they can say next may be crucial and never would have thought to ask that question, okay? Always be thorough in your questions and ask as many open-ended uh, uh, open questions as you can. Um, yes, you're gonna wanna ask some fairly closed questions, right? You're gonna wanna ask yes or no, right? Does your family have a history of substance abuse? Well, then they may say yes. It's not enough to just click yes and move on, right? You're gonna to wanna to ask an open-ended question, all right? Like, can you tell me more about that, please? Right, that's the next item on here, right? Tell me more about that. And they'll say, well, you know, my, my mom, she died of a cocaine overdose, and my father drank a lot. And, um, you know, he never smoked weed, he never smoked cigarettes, but he passed away of cirrhosis of the liver. Okay, so these are things that are important. All right, to understand. Um, and finally, one question that I always follow up with towards the end of my assessments that has helped me over the years. I've come across some amazing information the clients have not told me that I think is really important, okay, to understand is ask the question, what did I forget to ask that I should know about you or your family history, right? Um, there was a period in time where I was working with a client um, who was a little bit older, and great guy, he was prone to intermittent, what appeared to be like rage fits. Out of nowhere, he would become really angry, um, very violent. He would threaten his wife who had been married with for years, and this was not his normal behavior. This was onset later in life. This wasn't like him all the time. So we were working with him because of all these problems that were coming up, presenting as a lack of, of, of dysfunction within his life now. And at the end of the assessment, we conducted all of our biopsychosocial categories, feeling good and pretty, pretty good about it. And at the end, I asked, is there anything that I forgot to ask that I should know about you and your family history? And, you know, he said, yeah, you know what? Um, I, I forgot to mention to you that my father, all right, he's older. He's in the hospital. He's dying of dementia. And when he said that, I said to myself, oh, my gosh, I, I need to go back. We need to make sure that this man, my client, receives a checkup. Because dementia can be passed down, okay, from one family to the next, from a family member to the next hereditary. Another thing, too, is important to understand is that at certain phases of dementia, irritability, rage, okay, can come forward. Later on, it was um, diagnosed that he had early stages of Alzheimer's, similar to his father, right? And medication was helping alleviate some of those symptoms for the time being. So what's really important to understand is that basic question, what did I miss? What am I missing um, that you think is important for me to know, okay? So just some tips on completing an assessment there. All right, finally, we're going to start to move forward uh, towards the end of our lesson now. And to tile this in, I know I have thrown a lot at you. If you feel like you need to go back and, and watch parts of this lecture to kind of brush up, please feel free to do that, okay? Um, I know that it can seem dizzying when I'm giving you all this information, but please know. The expectation for me in this, of course, isn't for you to become this comprehensive master 
at completing assessments in 16 weeks, right? You're learning case management and documentation as a whole. So please don't stress, all right? Don't become anxious over this. Let me just give you a quick analogy through history on why, to wrap up the lesson, why assessments are so important, why it's so important to take the time to practice these steps here, all right, as social workers when completing assessments. And so to kind of freshen up our mind, let's step out of the role for a social worker now. Let's go back in time and let's go to the Civil War, okay? I wanna to go to the Civil War. I wanna to go to the Civil War and I wanna talk about very briefly surgeries and I wanna talk about bacterial infections related to the Civil War. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect it to assessments. And some of you are saying, I know you're thinking it right now, how do you plan on doing that, Dr. Mayiko? Don't worry. Let's follow the bouncing ball. Stay with me on this, okay? Doctors, as we know, medical doctors make an oath, and what the oath is referred to as is to do no harm. They make an oath, okay, that they state that whatever they do in their practice with an individual who is sick or is hurting, they will never do that client harm. They will never intentionally place that client in harm's way, all right, as a result of that, because doctors are aimed to treat and not do harm. Okay, so that is the whole point of the do no harm oath. Okay, so let's examine the Civil War really quickly. Civil War, as we know, is one of the bloodiest wars in the history of our country. Right? I'm not going to lay out all that history lesson, but many of you may know that a lot of folks died in the Civil War, not from battle itself, but from disease and infection in particular. Many of you know that during the Civil War, surgeries were crude, okay, and they were unsophisticated. Surgeries involved these toolkits here. This is literally a Civil War surgeon's toolkit. And if you notice, you would not want to be on the business end of this saw or bone cutters, right? Or grinders on the skull to alleviate pressure from head wounds, right? So what happened was in the Civil War, many times an individual was wounded, that wound would become infected. And as a result of this, doctors had to begin cutting ahead of the infection to try to stop the infection in order to prevent sepsis from setting in and killing individuals. So in the Civil War, a gunshot didn't necessarily kill a soldier in one shot. That was a big problem. The, 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 the individuals that were wounded in the Civil War either later died of sepsis, of a massive infection that set in in the wound, or from lead poisoning because they couldn't remove the bullet, okay? So Here's some quick stats that I want to do, and I'm going to draw in this, this level into assessment. While it may be assumed that most causes of mortality during the Civil War were due to battlefield injuries, it is statistically proven that disease was the number one killer during the Civil War. According to the impact of disease on the Civil War, okay, three-fifths of Union troops died of diseases. 63% of Union fatalities were due to disease, 12% due to wounds, 19% of deaths were due to death on the battlefield. Only 19% all right, of soldiers actually died or inflicted instantly from a wound on the battlefield. Likewise, and look at this last number, two-thirds of Confederate troops died of infection. Two-thirds of troops died of infections. How is that off even possible, right? So let me explain to you this process. These are doctors who have taken a step to do no harm. Now, during the Civil War days, doctors believed that infectious bacteria, bacterial infections, were transmitted through the air rather than through unclean instruments and dirty hands. They simply didn't understand through science at this point in time, all right, that bacteria was on the surfaces, all right, of the instruments they were using. So as a result, doctors opened windows to let in fresh air all right, with the hopes of getting that dirty air out of surgical rooms. In fact, some doctors on the battlefield set up tents outside on the battlefield in order to allow air to move because they didn't want the infection setting in. And so in a rush to get ahead of infections, to cut ahead of the infections, doctors did not wash surgical equipment or their hands, and they quickly moved from one patient to another. So dirty saws with blood and bacteria on them left the limb of one soldier and that doctor said open up the windows we don't want the infection setting in took that same saw and operated on another soldier nearby okay this lack of understanding was the root cause okay while act uh while action oriented um good-hearted right doctors um were actually doing more harm than good okay and so it wasn't that these doctors were looking 
to mistreat their clients, right? It wasn't that these doctors were intentionally going around saying, I want to spread bacterial infections from one to the un another. Through their own scientific ignorance, they didn't understand that the bacteria that they were using was on their instruments. And in the process of trying to do more good, they actually did more harm, okay? That's the analogy that I want to make, all right, to our, whoa, don't know what happened there. Hold on one second. Apologize for that. Look at that technical difficulty, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so here's what I wanted to, to do. So this is why our biopsychosocial spiritual assessments are more important, okay? We have to ensure that at the core of our plans, of our assessments, that our plan is laid out to do no harm, right? We can't inadvertently cause more hurt, more trauma to our clients when we think we're helping. If we get an assessment wrong and our strategies end up hurting a client more than helping them, then we failed as a social worker, okay? So that's important to understand. And sometimes we may think we're doing the right thing. We may be like those Civil War doctors saying, we need to move quickly. There's no time to wash. And hey, infections spread through the air anyway. I'm not worried about it. And they move on, then they're actually causing no harm. We can't be that doctor. Challenges presented in our lives are usually complex and multifaceted, right? By the time a client is coming to us, if they just needed the food bank, they would have had the food bank and they would never need to see a social worker. If they just needed tutoring, they would have gone to a tutor, their grade would have improved, and they wouldn't need to come to a social worker, right? If they needed help with their rent and they got their money one day and now lo no, and their, their rent's been paid and they're never going to miss again, they would no longer need to come visit a social worker. But many times, by the time a client has come to us, it is because challenges have presented themselves that have impacted their daily lives on a significant level and they're not going away anytime soon without intervention. And so we have to assume that when a client comes to us and they say, you know what, I'm just struggling in school right now. Yeah, they probably are struggling in school, but it may not be just because of school. It may not be because math is hard, all right? It may be because there's abuse going on in the home. It may be because there's no running electricity or water in the home. It may be because they haven't eaten in 24 hours because there's no food in the house, right? So it's important to understand that. Impairments in multiple categories may simultaneously contribute to dysfunction in someone's life. I think we covered that fairly uh, comprehensively, right? When we looked at those, those categories of our assessment, right? I gave you examples of how a category in our social aspect of our lives can have a psychological impact on our well being, right? Um, when we conduct comprehensive assessments, those allow us to effectively treat the root cause of the problem and not the symptom. So here, we weren't treating the cause of the problem, right? We thought we were getting ahead of the infection. What we were really doing was passing the infection, the infection along to others. We were increasing the symptomology, right? When we get our case plans, our case management um, assessments correct, we are able to address the root of the problem. So that client that comes to you and says, I'm struggling in math, and we give them the tutor and it doesn't help. And we find out, well, why are you still struggling in math? Well, I haven't been going to school. I've been missing first period and my math is first period. Well, why are you missing first period? Well, because I'm tired at night. Well, why is it you're tired at night? Well, I'm scared to go to sleep. Why are you scared to go to sleep? Because we don't have any electricity. And why don't you have an electricity? Well, my mom's been off of work because she got fired. Why was my mom fired? Why was your mom fired? Well, because she drinks a lot. Okay. So now we've got an issue that we need to address. So Mom's drinking a lot. Let's start talking about how we can help mom. What is it that's triggering her, right? So that we can get things back on track with this family unit. So you can see how we want to tre treat the root cause, not the symptom, right? The tutor didn't help because it wasn't addressing mom's drinking. See what I'm saying? Assessment allows us to identify a problem, identify effective strategies, and to address the problem and to quantify these, these, um, these uh, goals, okay? So, when we conduct a comprehensive assessment, we don't have to do any guesswork because we would have established what the problem was. And I'm going to teach you later on in this course how you build strategies, all right, so you can actually see progress being made with your clients, all right? So I know I threw a lot at you. Thank you for sticking with me, all right? We're going to go ahead and close out today's lesson with our centering activity. Let me go ahead and make sure I just bring up my timer here and then we'll move into our centering for the end of the day so 
Today's centering verse comes from Psalm, okay, Psalms. I will sing your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress, right? This comes from Psalms 59, 16. Our focus word for today will be refuge, refuge, right? So um, a lot of times, I don't know if you're like me, but um, sometimes, you know, especially when you're going through a master's program like this, it can feel like you're drinking water through a fire hose, right? Like you've got that, that spigot on and you are just being flooded by information, deadlines, due dates, whatever the case is. It's always important to kind of just keep in track in our mind right now the expectation that's at hand. So I'm not going to speak for other professors at other classes. If you're feeling overwhelmed with the material that you're receiving in case management, here's what I want and ask for you to put in perspective, right? The expectation here is not for you to leave as a finished product from this course. The expectation is for you to dip your toe, right, into the pool of case management and documentation, right, so you can feel the temperature of the water, right? I'm not expecting you to be an expert, not expecting you to be perfect, okay? So when I throw all this information at you, it's recorded in a lesson, so you can go back and you can review it later, right? If some of you need to watch this five times, you, you watch it five times and you won't be judged for it, right? And so sometimes it's important to understand you're not striving for perfection in this process, right? You're just getting exposure. And then second, what I'd ask you to consider is where is your refuge, right? Where are you able to gain strength and perspective in what you're being asked to do while you're in this program, right? So consider from Psalms what this scripture verse is meaning to you when you're centering and focusing on the fact that as you're going through all of this, that God is with you right now in this moment. I will sing your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in my day of distress. So if you're feeling distressed, right, take two minutes, right, to pass that on. Give that to God and seek refuge in your relationship with him, okay? So let's go ahead and make sure our hands and feet are in a nice, comfortable position. Let's push out all those worries, those expectations, those concerns. Forget about all that for two minutes. Just focus on the fact that God's with you, asking you, give me, give me that stress and that worry, right? I'll take it, take it off your shoulders. It's gone, all right? Take that nice deep breath, close your eyes, and I will keep track of the time. Okay, go ahead and take a nice deep breath. Open your eyes, come on back. Genuinely, thank you all so very much. I appreciate you hanging in there. I appreciate you sitting through all of this information. I know it seems like a lot now, but what you're learning here will make a difference for you in your career. So thank you, thank you for sticking with it. Quick reminders, please check Blackboard um, for any assignments and homework that you've got coming up. Reach out to me with any questions. If you are feeling like this right now, Right, and you're like, by golly, Dr. Mexico, I still need answers. I don't understand. Don't feel bad. Reach out to me. We'll connect via email. We'll figure it out. Um, if you want to meet in person, we can do that too, okay? Know that I am praying for you. Know that you will finish this, this semester strong and that you are my thoughts and prayers, okay? 
Thank you all so very much. I appreciate you all. See you next time. Thank you.